Welcome to Bio Media United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Ann Nelson. We're so happy that you're with us. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you for this time to spend in your presence in this space. A time to have a conversation with you silently. Hear a pastoral prayer and join our voices in this space to recite the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer, to hear your word read, and to hear your word proclaimed, and to be in holy fellowship with you and with one another. Be with us now as we worship together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Biomeda United Methodist Church, our Facebook page, Biomeda UMC, or our website, biomedaumc.org. Biomeda is spelled this way in two words. First word, Bayou, capital B-A-Y-O-U. Second word, Mito, M-E-T-O. Biomedo United Methodist Church. It's time for our call to worship. And today it comes from the Old Testament of your Bible, the book of Psalms, Psalm number 72, verses 1 through 7 and verses 18 and 19. Will you join me now? Take out your Bibles and find uh, Psalm 72. I'll be reading beginning in verse 1. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And just an aside, this is the end of the prayers of David, the son of Jesse. As is in our tradition, in our in-person service as it is in our online service. We take time now for a time of silent prayer after which I will say a prayer. And at the end of my prayer, I'll invite you to recite the Lord's Prayer along with me. Let us bow in silence. How great thou art, O God, how great thou art. How great is your love for us that is unconditional, invitational, and transformational. You loved us before we were born, and you love us still, no matter what we've done, have left undone, or what we may do in the, or not do in the future. A love so great that you gave your only son, Jesus, to come to this earth to teach us, to teach us how to live in relationship with you and in relationship with one another. A love so great that Jesus invites you and me to follow him and to learn from him and to grow more like him and like you, God. And Jesus' is invitational love invites us to follow him and when we accept that invitation and, and follow him and follow you, we begin to be more like you as you transform us with your transformational love. We thank you for this love that is so great that Jesus, your son, gave his life on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. 
and that on the third day after he would been crucified dead and buried you resurrected him from the dead you raised him from the dead and he walked again on this earth and we give you thanks for eternal life we give you thanks that we have the opportunity to worship together in this space in cyberspace when we're unable to attend in worship or choose otherwise we're thankful that for those who are watching and listening, we're thankful that we can we can be a presence that shares your love, your mercy, and your grace in this space. And we can invite others to give thanks and to pray for those who step into harm's way every day, keeping us safe, rescuing us in violent times, in, in natural disasters like floods and tornadoes and hurricanes and blizzards, and snow, and ice, and wildfires. We give you thanks for the military, the law enforcers, the first responders. And the firefighters. And we ask you to protect them and to bless them as they go about their responsibilities every day. And Lord, we entrust to your care now the prayers that we hold in our hearts. They have, we have written on pieces of paper names and concerns that we've shared with others asking for prayer. We entrust them all to your care now, Lord, as we recite the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson for today comes from the Gospel of Mark the, in the New Testament. It is the first chapter and the first eight verses. Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter one, the first eight verses. This is about John the Baptist preparing the way. Beginning in verse one. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me, after me comes the one more powerful than I the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me again? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. If you've heard the story of John the Baptist, we can't, we wonder, can anybody help John the Baptist find another job in this season of Advent? Because we know, if we know his story, what's going to happen to him if he doesn't stop his in-your-face preaching, and start acting like the rest of us. His parents, instead of naming him after his father Zachariah, did what 
God said and named him John, which means God is gracious. That's found in the Gospel of Luke, first chapter, verse 13. But John the Baptist is hardly acting that way. And he's out in the wilderness like Amos was. Amos was a prophet in the Old Testament. And he was demanding that people turn toward God in preparation for meeting the judge who is to come in the future. If he keeps up, keeps this up, we fear for his life. If we could just keep him occupied for the next several weeks, maybe we could find him another job. Maybe he could be our personal shopper. Maybe we could sit him down at the kitchen table and let him flip through the ad supplements. Find another job. First, he could make his own Christmas list, listing gifts for Cousin Jesus, parents Elizabeth and Zachariah, Aunt Mary and Uncle Joseph. And then he could make your list and shop for you too. Maybe we could take him along with us to some brunches and open houses. Or maybe lend him a stack of magazines and get him interested in some articles on the latest makeup, clothing, and holiday parties and what to eat and what not to eat to keep her slender figure. Or maybe we could pull some strings in the city office and get him a job to be the fire engine Santa and take him to the costume shop and get, help him rent a red suit and a white beard. And then he can ride into town on the fire engine throwing candy. Or maybe we could get him a job as the mall Messiah, mall Santa. He could sit on the Santa throne in the middle of the mall, listening to our children and grandchildren, tell him what they want for Christmas. Can anybody help John the Baptist find, find another job? Friends, even if we could, he wouldn't cooperate. You'd think this was his motto. motto. So many potential enemies, so little time. John the Baptist is going to offend almost everybody in his world before long. He will offend the religious leaders, the priestly Sadducees who make their living from the money people pay to make their sacrifices for sins in the temple. His baptisms for repentance is a competitor with the temple rites and the temple services, but his rites free. He's going to insult Sadducees and Pharisees by telling them the religious professionals that they aren't the ones favored by God just because of their profession or who they are. He's going to infuriate Herod, the Roman king, and because Herod has recently put aside his first wife to marry the wife of his half-brother, and John the Baptist will condemn him for it. But wait, there's more the infomercials say. John the Baptist is attracting big crowds. They're pouring out into the desert and their predictions galore. That when big crowds pour into the desert, it means the judge from God was coming to overthrow the powers that be. So our young and fearless prophet, John the Baptist, if he doesn't make a radical turnaround from his present course, if he doesn't stop offending everybody under the hot desert sun, he's going to be led in chains to the prison and beheaded. John's just not cut out to fit in with our cultural Christmas. He would make a poor Santa on a fire engine. Instead of throwing candy canes, he'd probably stand up and shout, this year be better be different. Going through the motions of a cultural Christmas isn't going to guarantee you peace, joy, or the perfect gift on Christmas Eve. Christmas is not going to be the way you think it will. John wouldn't last five minutes as the Santa on the throne of the mall. He doesn't want to hear what we have and what we want for ourselves and what we want for our families. John the Baptist is a prophet. He's here to tell us what God wants from us and for us. Advent's a busy time. It's the time before 
we celebrate the birth of Jesus the first four weeks before Christmas Day and Christmas Eve. It's filled with baking and shopping and decorating. And it's a time of year of burglaries and depression and suicides and domestic violence. It's a world where darkness is yearning for the light. Light of the one who brings the light into the world and into our lives. Cultural Christmas isn't all bad. Celebrating life and family and all that. The problem with cultural Christmas is that it's glommed onto our celebration of the incarnation that in many ways stands in this direct opposition to it. If we were to read Mary's song in Luke 1, 46 through 55, you'll hear that next Sunday right here. We begin to see a stark contradiction. There's different, things are very different now than they were when the crowds flocked to see John the Baptist to repent of their sins and be baptized. And yet there's a connecting thread. Then was a time of giving and profound prayer by some. And the Advent season is that way for many of us now. Then there's a time of self-absorption, greed, and trivialization of God's message by others. Like the Advent season is for many now. Then the crowds flocked to him because here was someone with the courage to set them straight. Someone with the courage to confront the ones and confront them with the preparation God demands for the coming Messiah. I wonder, I wonder what it would take to get us to flock to him now. What's it going to take to get us to do that? I have one word. And that word is repentance. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia. It means a radical 180 degree, degree turning around. Repentance means a turnaround. Have you ever had a turnaround? It can come when somebody cares enough about us to tell us the harsh truth about ourselves. That's the definition of a genuine friend, somebody like John the Baptist, willing to pay a high price to tell you and me the truth about ourselves. To be forgiven, we must first repent. Mark's gospel brings and begins the ministry of John the Baptist, calling every one of us to repentance and baptism for the forgiveness to get ready for the kingdom to come, the kingdom of the one who is coming, the one who baptizes not simply with water, but baptizes with the Holy Spirit. To repent, we must know how and have an understanding of repentance. Now, Jews were the children of Abraham by birth, and baptism was reserved for converts who wanted to become Jewish. But, listen carefully, John's message in the gospel, John's message and invitation were so compelling that those who were already converted to Judaism by birth confessed their sins and submitted to baptism by John the Baptist. As John promised in verses 7 and 8, Jesus has entered our world with a compelling message similar to John's, repent and receive the good news. The disciples were commanded to share his good news, as we read in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, and to baptize those who received the gospel. So what do both baptism and repentance mean for us today, for you and me? What does baptism and repentance mean for us? And what is the good news that we are to, share, to receive and to share with others? When Alice McKenzie, she's a professor at, a, at Perkins uh, Theological Seminary at SMU in Dallas. When she first started out in ministry, she thought everything was going to be easy to be a minister because she was so strong and she didn't need support from others. She was waiting, walling herself off from others. She was putting a good face to her colleagues, 
A good friend of hers, also a pastor, saw her through her game face and said to her, Isn't it funny how sometimes we think our greatest strength is really our greatest weakness? It was as though her friend slapped her in the face. What do you mean by that? And her friend said, You already know. That's like John the Baptist and someone else telling us the harsh truth about ourselves. In the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, chapter 27, verse 6 says this, Prof Profuse are the kisses of an enemy, but well meant are the wounds a friend inflicts. Mackenzie once preached a sermon on a text and on that text. And afterwards, two men from the congregation went up to her. Gus and Roy were retired and had been friends and members of the church for many, many years. And Roy said, your sermon reminds us of a time a couple of years ago when we were both in a Bible study on Jesus' teachings about not judging. And Gus said to me privately after one session, Roy, you really need this verse because you tend to see people's faults before you give them a chance to show you their virtues. Now that made me angry, said Roy. But later I realized Gus was right and I thanked him for it. John the Baptist is a friend who dares to tell us the truth about our preparations for Christmas. There's many types of sin. There's the sin that shows itself in preoccupation with outward details and forgets the inward meaning they were meant to portray. And this is the sin of the Pharisees and their rituals, thinking that going through the motions of another cultural Christmas would guarantee us the joy of the Christ child on December 24th. Friends, we can run, but we cannot hide. We need to remember and realize that two verses in the Bible, not in Mark, but in the Gospel of John and then the book of Revelation, tell us that we need to know about this time of year when we prepare and await the birth of the Christ child. Listen to these two verses, the first from the Gospel of John. It should be familiar. John 3.16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the first verse. The second verse is from Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he will be with me. Friends, the message of Christmas is that God not only came to us, but he's still here. He's still here. We can run, but we cannot hide. We need to wake up and realize that our prayers don't invite God's presence. Our prayers don't invite God's presence. Our prayers acknowledge that God is already here and wants to have a personal relationship with each one of us, with you and with me and everyone else. We don't earn God's favor. God comes along when everything's going wrong. God comes when we aren't doing anything. God comes along when we're naughty and when we're nice. Why does he do this? Because God loves us and we're highly favored. But that doesn't mean that bad things won't happen. Have we ever found ourselves in a similar situation? We've always done everything right and been faithful to God and family a few weeks before Christmas or any time, really. And we find out that our job's being eliminated and our business is closing. God's love and favor on us, on you and on me don't mean that the path of faith will be neat and tidy and predictable. Not hardly. When bad things happen, trouble comes and it will. And we will fall from grace and sin, but we can repent. And we need someone with courage. Someone who cares about us to take us by the shoulders and turn us around to transcendent, to, from irritability to incarnation to repentance. Because if we don't turn around, 
we won't see who's coming on Christmas Eve. The one John has been warning about. The judge who will use a winnowing fork to divide us into wheat and chaff. And if we don't turn around, we won't see that. When Jesus gets to the Jordan's edge, he doesn't do what John expected him to do. You know what he did? He waded into the water with the rest of the sinners and bowed his head to be baptized by John. Here's God incarnate, enfleshed in Jesus, who has nothing of which to repent, whose will is already aligned with God's. Here is the Messiah who comes to judge. Yes, but also to bring sight to the blind, leaping to the lame, healing to the deaf, hearing to the deaf, healing to the diseased, and good news to the poor. Instead of you and me trying to find John the Baptist a new job, we ought to be thanking him for what he's doing. He's living up to his name. God is gracious. Without his stern, direct challenge to repent, we might not be ready for the coming one, the Christ child, when he arrives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for being with us on this second Sunday of Advent. John the Baptist gets in our face and tells us what we need to do and gives us the harsh truth of how we need to recognize that God is present with us every moment of every day, every day of the year, every day of our lives. If you don't know him, would you come to him now and accept that invitation that Jesus offered? Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Come follow me and begin a new life. You can do it where you are. Just say, God, I've repented of my sins. Forgive me. I want a new life and follow you, Jesus. And then if you want to know and do more, reach out to me. Our email address is found on our YouTube page, our Facebook page, and on our website. Receive a benediction. Go forth into the world, sharing the love of God and life in Jesus Christ. Sharing the harsh truth with your friends so that they too can turn around and see who's coming. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. And we hope that you're back with us on for our Sunday services. It opens at 10 a.m. on Sundays on our YouTube channel, Biomeda United Methodist Church, our Facebook page, Biomeda UMC, and on our website, biomedaumc.org. Our Thursday Hope and Prayer for Our World, a devotional chat, is on th opens on Thursdays at 12 noon each week, and we hope that you're there with us to share time in praying for our world. Once the Sunday worships open at 10 a.m. and the Thursday devotional chat opens at 12 noon. They're opening forever. So you don't have to be here on Sunday, but we hope that you're here on Sunday or another day worshiping with us and being in devotional prayer with us. Until we meet again, may God bless you. I'm Reverend Ann Nelson, pastor of Baumita United Methodist Church. <laughs>